These plants are potentially very valuable. For one thing, they enrich the sea, all right? If you have trees on land, you have fish in the sea. Fishermen know that because the leaves fall, they're decomposed by microorganisms. They form the bottom of a complex food chain. Our plans are not to let the leaves grow old and drop. We view mangrove trees not as trees anymore, but as a perennial pasture. And our plan is to cut the leaves and feed them to sheep and goats. Uh, in a while, we should be able to produce more sheep and goats than the people can eat. Uh, I think they'll have to sell a lot of the meat, which is expensive, and buy beans. Okay, and this way I think they can produce enough food for the whole country. To feed the whole country, Sato would need to grow mangroves all along the Eritrean coast. But mangroves only grow naturally where rivers enter the sea, bringing in vital minerals. So he would have to provide these artificially elsewhere. In a research center in the town of Masawa, he examined the composition of seawater and discovered that nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron, crucial for mangrove growth, were all missing. Using fertilizer to provide these, Sato began experimenting on a barren stretch of waterfront. This is the area where the Manzanar project really started. Uh, what we did was we planted trees in this area where trees had never grown before. And most of the experiments were failures. And the trees that fail you don't see because they, they obviously died. So it took us some time to discover that we had to bury a bag of nitrogen, phosphorus, and leave a piece of iron. And when we do that, these trees are growing at, at a very fast uh, clip. After figuring out what trees needed to grow, uh, and we've demonstrated it here, we then moved uh, to a substantial planting in the middle of Masawa. And that was very satisfying. Trees had never grown there before. They would never grow there unless they were grown by our methods. And they're in the middle of town so that the whole populace sees them. And what we hope is that this will sink into the consciousness of the local population and they'll begin to see the value of planting mangroves for themselves and utilizing them. The mangroves by the causeway proved that Sato's techniques could work anywhere along Eritrea's tidal zone. The next step was to plant mangroves that could be cultivated to feed animals. Sato and two of his workers are visiting the Ministry of Fisheries in Masawa, which supports the project. Mangrove trees were planted in the garden here in 1998 and are now regularly harvested. But the garden brought a new set of challenges, not least an absence of seawater. This site is slightly above uh, sea level, right? So to uh, grow trees above sea level and water them with seawater was a challenge. And for this, we had to, in the beginning, get seawater pumps. Uh, but after a while, what we've done by digging deep holes and planting the trees deeply, the roots have gone down to even the lowest high tide, so that we no longer have to water anything here. It just grows by itself. This is a good model for what the desert country around here could become. A garden, a beautiful garden, productive of uh, commercial value and, yet, and beautiful at the same time. The mangrove trees have thrived and are now pruned every few days. From here, the cuttings are taken to the research center, where they're eagerly awaited. Mangrove trees survive in seawater by excreting salt through their leaves. So this has to be washed off, albeit with salt water, before they can be eaten. As part of the experiment, a magic ingredient is also added to make the mangroves as nutritious as possible. Well, we sprinkle the cuttings with urea. And the reason we do this is that in the gut of the sheep and goats, the cellulose of the leaves are digested to produce sugar, okay? And the urea provides ammonia, and the combination of sugar and ammonia makes protein. So we give the goats and the sheep a richer protein diet. But we think it's not a good idea to feed animals just one thing, so that's why we're diversifying by growing grasses and shrubs that will include as a supplement to the mangrove diet. 
Satisfied that both his trees and his animals were growing according to plan, Sato began an extensive planting program. In 2001, he planted 40,000 mangrove trees on the coast near the village of Hergigo. First thing in the morning, Sato's planting team head out for another day on the mudflats. With daily temperatures that can reach 45 degrees Celsius, the cooler early mornings here are not wasted. Before the first truckload of mangroves arrives, the villagers measure out where each tree will be planted. They're carefully spaced out so that each mangrove has plenty of room to spread as it grows. With the arrival of the first delivery, planting can begin. These saplings have traveled 20 kilometers down the coast, but for the last part of their journey, they're now carried by hand, several hundred yards across the mud flats to their final resting place. The mangroves have been grown in a nursery to help develop the fragile root systems that will be critical for their survival here. Each tree is bedded in by hand, and alongside it, a bag of fertilizer is buried. This contains diammonium phosphate and urea, which will provide phosphorus and nitrogen in exactly the right quantities. Holes have been pierced in each bag, which will allow the fertilizer to seep out slowly over the next three years. Cages prevent damage caused by waves and seaweed which is caught in the wire mesh. These are anchored in the mud by a metal rod that also doubles as a source of iron for the young mangroves. As the morning progresses, Sato pays a visit to the site to check up on how the planting is going. Abraham. Hey, Sato. Hey. Hey. Ah, come in. Come in. Okay. How is the work going? Uh, it's okay. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. what I'm worried about is uh, when they bury the fertilizer bag, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometimes they don't bury it deep enough. And uh -huh. the reason is it floats. Yeah. So can you ask them to, when they put the bag in, push, squeeze down so the air leaks out of the bag? Uh-huh. Huh? Then bury it. Then bury it. Okay. I keep on telling them. Anyway, they are used to it now. Like, They're used to you telling them, but they still don't do it, huh? Yeah, anyway, mm -hmm. we have to uh, supervise them all the time. Yeah. 